What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Welcome, bike, to the guys on this list because today we're talking about our top bounce back players for 2021 fantasy football, specifically the running backs. Some of these guys got injured last year. Some of them just didn't perform well. You can call them the post-hype sleepers, but I feel like that, those, that's just for young players who kind of disappointed and now it's their post-hype. But these are guys who have been good, who didn't do good last year for whatever fucking reason, and now they're going to be good again. All right. I'm going to talk about these guys because they're important because their ADP starts to dip and they're usually the best value in fantasy football drafts. And if you're new, if you're new to the channel, we're doing fantasy football videos literally every single day leading up to your drafts, hopefully prepping you in the right direction. Sometimes I say some ignorant shit, but every once in a while, something hits, all right? Something hits, and for that reason, you should subscribe to the channel, right? It's a button right below the video that says fucking subscribe in red, okay? Just hit that real quick. We're really close to 50,000, and I feel like after this video, we shall be there, all right? So go help go help your boy out. Got a lot of energy today, which is probably going to lead to a text message from my landlord saying, what the fuck is the thumping and thrashing going on up there? So shout out to the landlord as well. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to my tucked in shirt. I already did it. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. And let's eat. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is just this. This is a uh, you know I, I posted this on Twitter. I asked who your who your top bounce bike players are for the year. We got a lot of people you know talking about C Mac and Saquon and guys like that. And listen, I want to I'm leaving those guys off the list because they're really fucking obvious. I mean, C Mac's the 101. Obviously, everyone knows he's going to bounce back, right? A lot of the top guys last year, C Mac, Saquon, Eckler, like all those guys got hurt for significant portions of the year, and now they're still being drafted accordingly. So I don't. No one needs me to waste their time. Not in this economy on guys who were hurt last year or were down last year, but are going in the right draft spots this year, right? C-Mac 101, Saquon's like 103, 104. Everyone knows he's going to bounce back. Eckler being picked where he should be picked. Back into the first round, PPR leagues, early second round, whatever, whatever, whatever. So these are the guys I think are going to not only bounce back, but are great values in drafts right now that should be going higher. And number one on this list for me is easily Ezekiel Elliott. I know I have talked ad nauseum, ad nauseum. I don't really know what that actual phrase is, to be honest with you. Ad nauseum, like an advertisement nauseum about Ezekiel Elliott. Ezekiel Elliott's being picked in like the end of the first round in Superflex leagues. He's going to be a, a second round pick most likely. And that's just too damn low for a guy that I think is going to be back into the top three, four running back fantasy conversation okay and he's like my Keenan Allen of the running back position where I've talked about him 58 bajillion times already but again for those y'all that are new to the channel I want to give you the click the quick cliff notes on why I'm really really hyped up about Ezekiel Elliott this year and it pretty much stems from the fact that one he was awesome two years ago he was even better in the five games in which Dak was starting and Dak was under center for the Cowboys in the beginning of the year last year and now Dak is healthy again okay so we saw a drop off in Zeke's numbers last year in terms of like yards per carry it was the lowest of his career yeah because the offensive line literally fucking died and I don't expect that to be the case going into this year PFF did a rankings list on their website of the top 32 offensive lines you know, the rankings of all the offensive lines going into 2021, and the Cowboys are ranked number six, okay? And here's some uh, little glimpse into what they were talking about and the health of last year. The Cowboys starting tackle duo of Lyle Collins and Tyrone Smith combined for 154 snaps during the 2020 season after starting center Travis Frederick retired in March, okay? 154 snaps was basically, since they were at a blistering pace last year, the Cowboys were, that's basically uh, they each played one full game. So you have Lyle Collins, Tyrone Smith, who anchored the offensive line, missed most of the season. You have Travis Frederick retiring, and then you have all pro Zach Martin started just nine games this past year, okay? They got their mans is back, except for Travis Frederick. He's still retired. He's still very much retired. But the other dudes are back. PFF has them ranked sixth coming into the year this year. Guys, we cannot, we cannot overstate that Zeke is on the second year of his $90 million contract. Fuck what you heard about Tony Pollard. Y'all are trying to be too big of brains out here talking about Tony Pollard getting more involved. It's Zeke. It is Zeke. They told us with the money. They told us with the touches when he came back healthy last year. He was banged up last year. He had to play behind Ben fucking Danucci. He had to play behind third string offensive linemen. Guys, there was nothing working in Zeke's favor. When you look at the elusiveness, the juke, the juke rate, the, those kind of advanced metrics, Zeke was just as good last year as he's been the, uh, his first two, three seasons in the league. Okay. When you look at what the Cowboys did with Dak in those five starts before he got hurt, 
blistering pace. They were running an unbelievable amount of plays per game. They were averaging 32.6 points per game, which would have been number one in the NFL last year, which means the scoring opportunities are going to be there for this offense and more importantly for Ezekiel Elliott. I don't think people understand that Zeke was averaging or on pace, sorry, on pace for 99.2 targets last year. Over 99 targets he was on pace for. That's like fucking Saquon C-Mac type numbers, Kamara type numbers. You give Zeke those targets, which I don't expect it to be probably that high, but you give Zeke 75, 85 targets plus the opportunity to score on the goal line almost every single game. Guys, draft him confidently and let's fucking party like it's 2017. Do not be scared off of Zeke this year. I am telling you, he's fine. He's bike. Dyke's bike. The, excuse that word. Dak's bike gets very, very confusing in my brain sometimes. Dak's bike, offensive line bike, Zeke bike, Joe Mixon. Dare I say it? Dare I say it, Joe Mixon? Bike. This is my official declaration that I'm bike on Joe Mixon. Okay? I'm here. I'm here for it. I was I was one steering away from Joe Mixon last year, okay? I wasn't one of those guys hyping him up last year. I thought he was easily one of the riskiest running back picks in 2020 fantasy football where he was going. Now he's going RB11, RB12, middle of the second round. If you're talking about two quarterback leagues or super flex leagues, he's going at the end of the second round, and that is beautiful because I would say that RB12 is going to be his floor given the opportunity that we are about to see. We're about to see a massive, massive opportunity for Joe Mixon, and... I will preface by saying I hate when people say that, like, oh, that's his floor. Like, he's only going to be as bad as that or higher. You have to look at what what is the likelihood that he finishes around there, okay? Like, it's like, yes, his 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 floor is RB12. His realistic ceiling, I would say, is probably around, like, RB6 to RB7, right? I'm not projecting him to be, like, the RB3 or RB4 because there's a lot of holes still in Mixon's game. Like, is he still going to, is he actually going to catch passes? We haven't seen it in a while. Is his offensive line any good? Is his offense actually going to be good? Like, are there going to be opportunities for mixing this? All right. There's, there's a lot of question marks, but that's, that's for a whole different like strategy video. I think the floor is really, 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 really safe. And if you're fading Joe Mixon this year, you're doing it because you're worried about an injury, which I suppose pose is kind of fair after last year he played in six games but I feel like that was a weird year and he just sat out for the rest of the year after a mysterious like foot toe injury whatever it was year prior he played a full 16 game he's he's 16 games he's not injury prone all right based off everything that I've looked at from doctors from from Twitter doctors uh, it's not an injury that we need to worry about in 2021 Mixon was an easy fade for me last year because Gio was still there and as long as Gio was there they were not using him correctly on third downs. He was taking away too many targets. He was taking away too many passing down situations, and it just capped Mixon's ceiling. Gio is gone now, and the rest of the backfield scrubs, you're talking about Samaji Ryan, Travion Williams, new rookie out of Michigan. Some people like Chris Evans, a six-round pick or whatever. No one catches the ball better than Mixon does, so Mixon should have that role. And you just look at some of the reports that they've been talking about out of Cincinnati's camp over uh, the last month or so. Bengals OC Brian Callahan said he doesn't want Joe Mixon to leave the field on third downs. Athletics' Paul Daner believes Bengals running back Joe Mixon will handle the largest workload of his career. You tag on an extra 15 to 20 receptions to Mixon's previous totals by virtue of Gio Bernard being gone, okay? You'll see Samaji Piran give him a breather for maybe, yeah, I mean, obviously, that shit's going to happen. But Mixon has had season totals of 208 touches, 280 touches, 313 touches. So when we're talking about having a career high in touches, we're talking about possibly eclipsing that 350 touch mark. Anytime Mixon is healthy, he's getting 18 to 20 carries a game. The question has always been on passing downs. Geo or not, Geo in the lineup, Geo not in the lineup, Mixon's good for 19 to 20 carries a game. If we start adding more targets and receptions, we're looking at a really, really strong volume year. And with Burrow, with Joe Burrow possibly banged up, like it is very, very possible that we see them lean on the running backs early and often. It's it's very possible that we see like in the first eight games of the season, Mixon have 20 plus carries in like four, five, six of those games right off the rip. The first first half of the season should be very, very Mixon volume heavy. Um, and while I don't think the line is like incredibly improved, they did sign Riley Reef. They did use their second, fourth, and sixth round pick on the offensive line. If anything, it is starting to move into the right direction. It can't be any worse than it's been the last few years. And don't forget, Joe Mixon just got that four-year, $50 million extension. It's time they unleash him, and I am in on Mixon bouncing bike this year in a strong way. The volume is just going to be too high to ignore what he could be as a second round pick, as your RB2. And this is where it gets ugly. This is where it gets ugly. 
third guy on this list, you know, there are not a lot of like middle round running backs that you can really peg as bounce backs. There are a lot of like younger because we've had an influx of running back talent over the last couple of years. You know, it's like the J.K. Dobbins, the DeAndre Swifts. I could put Chris Carson on this list, but I've also talked about him like 48 times. I like Chris Carson as a bounce back player who, you know, was injured and, and lost some time, but he was good when he was in the lineup. So I don't think anyone's like talking about him, how he had a very down year. But the middle rounds are a lot of young players who haven't really broken out yet. So bounce back is kind of unfair. I saw a lot of Miles Sanders in my uh, in my mentions, which I am off on Miles Sanders. If you saw my video yesterday, one of my shorts, the Eagles running back group is just a committee to fucking avoid at all costs. So this so this running back is a, is a later round pick. This running back is the Houston Texans running back, David Johnson. <clears throat> Fuck, it hurt. I feel like I needed to whisper that. David Johnson, David Johnson, David, 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 David fucking Johnson. All right. All right. It's David Johnson. Just like Mixon, I was very, very adamant about fading David Johnson last year, man. I just thought we knew what he was. It was going to be a volume back that had injury history that we hoped to catch passes. And you had to draft him in like the fourth round. It was disgusting. First and foremost, here's what we have to put out there. I'm well aware this is fucking gross. I'm also well aware that Watson's likelihood of playing is very small. Right now, according to odds makers, Watson is plus 900 to start a game in 2021. That is a heavy, heavy underdog for y'all that don't bet. Plus 900 is not looking good for Deshaun Watson to start a game in 2021. Should you be drafting anyone on this Houston team in 2021? Probably not. But I imagine that this team is going to be very similar to what we saw from the Bengals a couple years ago when Andy Dalton got hurt. And they were relying on backup quarterbacks and backup backup quarterbacks where Joe Mixon was getting like 28 carries a game just to literally kill clock so they weren't like relegated to the fucking, uh, fucking XFL. They were losing by like 45, 50 every game. It didn't stop that from happening. And uh, DJ might just be forced into a really high volume role. And believe it or not, I actually think... He's got some left in the tank. And when you look at his receiving numbers on player profile, the advanced metrics, he was a very good running back when he was asked to play on third downs and he was asked to run routes, which he was often asked to do number one in routes run last year. So in the passing game, like I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about David Johnson's uh, outlook for this year. So if you're in a PPR league, this becomes even, even better of a pick. His ADP is so fucking low right now. You're getting him in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th round of drafts right now. Nobody wants to touch David Johnson. I'm well aware that there's a good chance he averages like 1.6 yards per carry. But he's also going to average 1.6 yards per carry from the one-yard line because he's getting 100% of those goal line carries in Houston. I, I understand that 100% of the goal line carries in Houston might equate to four fucking goal line carries this year, but I'm more optimistic about the passing game, okay? And that's where I get a little bit of excite, uh, excitement. It almost feels like it almost feels like a fucking uh, arbitrage. Mm, I don't know if it's the right way to put it. An arbitrage Chase Edmonds play, to be honest with you, except on a worse team. The, the Texans right now have a win total from Vegas at 4.5. There are going to be a ton of targets to go around, all right? Uh, it's not just a win total of 4.5, but their defense is going to be fucking atrocious. These players are, this team is going to be letting up like 35, 40 points a game. They're going to be in catch-up mode for like 80% of their entire season this year. They brought in Mark Ingram, whose, whose prime was so far pre-COVID that he, he might not even make the fucking team, to be honest with you. They bring in Philip Lindsay, who will be a fine breather back for David Johnson, I think, uh, but he's a shitty pass-catching back, and he needs big holes to succeed, uh, to break through. He's a very like upright runner, and the Texans are not going to give him that their offensive line, their offense. It, it, that ain't going to happen, so I don't see him having a lot of success here on the Texans in 2021. So I think it's just David Johnson's backfield, man, for as long as he can stay healthy. Obviously, that is gonna be, that's going to be a concern because he's had trouble staying on the field for the the majority of his career but in the 10th 11th 12th round I think I think you're getting a guy who's going to give you 225 plus touches man that's not a ton a ton of volume but like all the way down here you're not getting volume like that from a starting running back and I think he has a very very high likelihood of again leading NFL running backs in just pure routes run so Johnson all the way down here call it a value pick call it a fucking bounce bike call it whatever disgusting terminology you want to use but you're allowed to attach my name to David Johnson this year oh boy I know you guys are like listen listen I fucking I, I fucking made the game on on fading these old running backs. Last year, go look at my 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 official fade list. It was everyone who's old and shitty, Mark Ingram, Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson, who all of you guys loved in the third, fourth, fifth rounds. Those are my top fades from last year. But you know, the situation, the offensive lines were bad. The offenses were bad. They were not good players anymore. You fade those guys in the third, fourth, fifth round. When you're getting 200 plus touches in the 10th, 11th, 12th round, it becomes another fucking story. Which is why we're going to move to our honorable mention. We have one player on this list. What up, big dog? Boom. 
forgot what I was gonna say there for a second. Sorry, Nicholas. No, it's, uh, this is a quick testimonial to the BDGE New York City Draft Weekend experience. Um, it's my third year doing it for good reason. You know, it's, it's just a dope ass weekend. It's a great time, you know, whether it be your first time in New York City or you've been there before, Nick and his team do uh, an excellent job of showing you a good time and having the weekend filled with, you know, different things to do other than obviously have, you know, the draft, but you actually get to experience New York if you haven't before. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun time. It's, it's a great time. I can honestly say I've met, you know, the guys that I've met through uh, these weekends, these trips, uh, I can call, you know, dear friends now. So if you love what Nick is doing with his brand and the content he puts out, which is why you're even considering doing, uh, you know, doing this trip, uh, it's, it's well worth it. It's, you know, you actually get to, to see and, you know, experience, you know, what Nick preaches uh, for his brand. And, you know, it's a lifestyle brand. So if you're thinking about doing it, it's strongly suggested. Uh, you won't regret it. It's dope time. Leonard Fournette. Leonard Fournette's another old back who I still think has a little bit to his game. This is, this is less of a, a Leonard Fournette pick. And again, more of an opportunity or a uh, just a team situation pick. I think someone on that Bucks backfield is going to get cut. I'm hoping it's Geo because that would open up the passing game again to Leonard Fournette, who was just dynamite down the stretch for the Bucks. He had six touchdowns in their final six games uh, in the playoffs. He was a monster producer. He was uh, he was averaging over 18 opportunities a game. He became the guy in that backfield. Question becomes: Fournette was getting you know five six targets a game. Does Geo start to eat into that? Because that starts to hurt the value but overall this team should flirt with leading the league in points per game they should be scoring at a wildly high efficient rate great defense which means they'll probably have to, to lean on their they don't have to but they they'll probably choose to lean on their running backs a little bit more because their defense is going to take care of games for them they won't have to air the ball out I just think you want a piece of this backfield uh Leonard Fournette is probably the guy I would rather have I think he's a little bit more explosive I think he's going to be involved more in the passing game than Ronald Jones and he's going in like the the ninth tenth round so listen <laughs> I sniff, I sniff a decent season out of Leonard Fournette this year, okay? So gamble on Leonard. You can even gamble on Rojo if you want to, but I, I would rather take the explosive guy in this backfield and the one who pa catches passes. So that is my list. That is my bounce bike running back list. I have Zeke, who I love, who's a great value in the first round. I have Joe Mixon, who I love, who's a great value in the second round. And then uh, and then you got a couple uh, older guys who I hated last year who I'm, I'm bike on this year, and that is David Johnson, and that is Leonard Fournette. Let me know in the comments section, are you are you on Miles Sanders this year? Are, is he on your list? Is he on this list for you guys? Because I can't seem to get around to it. Let me know who your top bounce bike players are at the running back position for 2021. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new again. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. I love y'all. Tomorrow will be our wide receiver position for this same video. Bounce bike wide receivers. I'll see you when I fucking see you. Goodbye.